Well, good evening and welcome to this Board of Education meeting for Tuesday, March 5th, 2024. You can all please stand for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and it is called for the liberty and justice for all people. Roll call, please. Mr. Grigsby? Here. Mr. Haynes? Here. Mrs. McCarthy? Here. Mrs. Saxon? Here. Mr. Baca? Here. Finalization of the agenda. Is there anything to add or remove? The agenda is final as presented. Thank you. We'll move right into the superintendent treasurer's report. Okay. So we have been having an exciting few weeks with the whole beginnings of building a new high school. And one of the things that we were most excited to look forward to was the feedback from our student group. So while this is very preliminary information and there will be lots of other touch points with student groups throughout the next 18 months or so, uh, Mr. Pritt is here to present to you um, some very important information and things to think about as we consider what kind of space the new North Ridgeville High School will look like. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Pritt. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I appreciate you being here this evening. Um, as Superintendent Casario said, we are at work on gathering some of that preliminary data and working towards, you know, putting together a plan that's going to support us not only short term but moving on down the road as well. So, um, one of those things that has taken place, aside from a number of meetings with staff, we'll talk a little bit about that, is we did survey students last week, actually. Um, you know, these are the people that have lived this for the better part of um, the, their high school career. And what's particularly unique about our high school students is they've come through this building, which is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So they've had the experience of being in a place a little more collaborative, a uh, place that is a little more student-centered, student-focused. Um, so to go to a traditional high school, I think it's good to, to hear from them. So to date, just for your own knowledge, we've had 26 meetings. Um, those meetings have varied in size from the entire high school staff meeting when we kicked off with them, all the way down to departments of two people. Um, there have been not 319 staff member touch points. And what that means is that if I have sat in a meeting as a member of the English department, that counts as me working with the architects. That counts towards that number. Um, so would not be included in these numbers would be the architects themselves or things of that nature. So we've had about 319 people um, meet with those groups. Uh, just under 40 people have taken some tours to see some other facilities, see what a modern high school might look like. That's one of the challenges I think a lot of people uh, face when they're going to new places, they know what they know. So it's, I think it's important to get folks out there and see kind of what some newer facilities look like. And then last week, we launched that survey and got 609 student responses from it. So uh, the survey itself was focused on two things. One is the student's experience while at the high school. And the other was about locker usage and how they <laughs> use lockers and would they use lockers. And um, so I've got some interesting information for you. There were 34 questions. I am not going to go over all 34 questions with you tonight, um, primarily because these folks over here would not allow me to return to my seat if I did. Um, <laughs> and as I said, we've got about 609 surveys completed. So when we look at that breakdown, 30% of those come from our 10th graders, 35% from our 9th graders, and you can see our 11th and 12th graders between those two make up about 34% or so. So it's a good representative sampling of our students. And when you think about this being rolled out, it was rolled out, um, students were asked to complete it during a specific period of the day. Those numbers make sense because we're going to have our juniors and our seniors, in some cases, off campus taking other courses. So we dive into a little bit about the academic background of where our students are. We're going to see that 57% of our students are in a traditional college prep route. 31% of our students are taking some kind of AP coursework. Um, college Credit Plus making up about 28%. And then you can see the STEM and the career tech represented there as well. So again, I feel like we've got a good sampling of what our students are taking throughout their grade levels. 88% um, of our students do not take classes off campus. Um, 
The stat that I don't have in here that I thought was really interesting was this question was followed up with a question that says, if you do take courses off campus, do you feel connected to the building or do you feel like you're missing out? 91% of these folks said, no, I feel like I'm connected to the building. I know what's going on. And so uh, I think we always have that worry about our students of if they're not with us, what are they thinking? At least in this case, they feel like they're still connected. So then we started to get into some of the how do you study, where you study, what does studying look like? So the biggest proportion of people here says, I can study anywhere as long as I have my headphones, my earbuds. Um, <laughs> obviously not something we're necessarily, probably not typing music through a new building, um, but some of this other information is just as good. 24% of our people like to study in a small quiet room. And I want you to remember that number as we move through some of these examples, because um, I think it shows how you can start to Take this information from a student perspective as you look at your spaces um, moving down the road. I study best when I am by myself is 51% of students. Um, and then another 37, so another large percentage of people say, I study best when I'm in a small group of three to eight people. So I, as an architect or architects of TDA, start to look at this information and we know that we need to create some spaces where students can either be by themselves and or be with a small group of students working on here. So then we take that one step further. Uh, to study best, I need um, music. Again, no surprise there. They shared that with us earlier. But I need comfortable furniture. And it would be great if I had access to snacks and beverages, and I need somewhere to where I get to my device, my tablet, or my laptop. What's not high here, what's going to show up here in a minute, is that natural light piece. So what students are telling us is, I need a small group room to study. It would be great if I could have some friends there. Natural light when I'm studying, not such a big deal. Remember that also. We asked students, what is the greatest concern that needs to be addressed? And they really fell into three <laughs> buckets. Most important things to our students is what we had talked about when we were back campaigning. We need natural light. So when you think about that small group space again, that small group space doesn't necessarily be in a space with windows, but we want to make sure that our regular classroom environments has those windows. Number one answer from students. And the way we came up with these numbers is students were given all nine of these as an option, and we're asked to rank them from most important to least important. So when you see 269 there, that means 269 students selected that as either their first or their second most important item that needed to be addressed. Just behind that is that student-centered learning environment. So we talked about the fact that the students had come through this building, and that's what they're looking for is to make sure that their education is going to be the focus in a new spot. We take a pretty substantial step back to some things that are still high importance, collaborative space, movable furniture, and technology. So on this list, we think about our students being technology literate and savvy and the importance of that. It ranked fifth on this list of most important items to them. Again, still of high importance, but you can see there's another gap down from there to those things that are less important. It's not important to students how we group classes together, whether it's social studies in one place and science in another. Um, decreased travel time is not a concern for students. Um, nor is storage or grade level. So what will be fun will be when we take this and we start to compare against staff service and how does all of that look. But it's very clear where the importance is from our student perspective and what's important to them when we start looking at these numbers. So really three groups of numbers that just naturally separate themselves into three piles. Um, I did want to share that because I don't want you thinking that I don't know how to line things up when I'm putting together a presentation. So <laughs> that is why they are in three pockets across your screen. <laughs> Um, is because I think they break naturally. Then we turn to lockers, and we ask the simple question, how often do you use a locker? 86% of our students never use a locker. Um, and we've got some reasoning for that. If you don't use a locker, why don't you use it? Well, 54% of our kids says, because I prefer my backpack. I always have the things with me that I need, you know, if I have my backpack. Only 26% of students said, it's because my locker's too far away from me. And then 14% of students said, I have enough stuff to take. You know, when you start asking about textbooks and how many textbooks do you need and what classes you need them for, you're gonna find that you need a textbook in less than half your classes right now is what the surveys told us. Um, when we asked the question, it, would you use a locker if it was closer to where, you know, your classes were? Two thirds of our students still say a locker is not important to them for that perspective. So then when you start thinking about this globally, you start thinking, you know, as a building, do you still provide a locker for every single student if two thirds of them are saying you're not going to use it? 
Or do you look at banks of lockers that maybe, you know, the example we like to use is a Cedar Point type of locker to where it's close to my class and maybe I'm using a keypad and just leaving my stuff there for a period or two and coming back to get it. So this is the type of data that we want to sort through over the coming weeks and months. <laughs> so we know that we have this. Where, where do we go from here? Um, and, and what's truly important, as we said, we met with staff all of last week. The admin team broke up those meetings in a small group meeting, met with departments anywhere from two people up through 14 people, is pulling together that collection of data from the staff, pulling to the, together the collection of data with the students, and start to think about, you know, what's important to make you know, this building everything we want it to be. In April, we'll be meeting with student groups. So we've met with staff groups. We'll continue to meet with them. We'll be meeting with them on the 19th of this month. But we are talking about what's important with the arts, what's important with the athletics, the academics, and our music groups. So those will be smaller group meetings with our architects and with our students to kind of break down what they've said here. And I'm moving on to that community engagement and focus group piece as well. The larger community, what do they want to see? What's important to them? So... Um, that's my piece of what I have for you, but I'd love to talk to you about data because you know that's kind of my thing. Um, do you have any questions? Can you go back to the greatest concern? That one. So per student body, student-centered learning, collaborative, prefer not to have lockers, want to carry everything with me, I want spaces to go to study, to hang out. Sounds an awful lot like college campus. You have summarized that well, my friend. Uh, it does sound a lot like a college right. campus. Um, and whether that's because that's what a lot of our students are experiencing when they're, you know, doing some of those CCP offerings um, or, or for some other reason, that's, I think, they're seeing the importance of working together. But no, you're absolutely right. It sounds a lot like a college campus. And if you look at less important, not a big fan of traditional. Traditional classrooms, traditional seating, traditional... Anything traditional. They, they like furniture that they can move to accommodate collaborative learning, study, and all those things is important to our student body. I think they showed that by what's most important when they started talking about the fact that they need music. Right. You know. <laughs> right. Yeah. We yelled at our kids growing up because you can't multitask like that. And that's just the world in which they live. Right. So providing those opportunities for a soft place to sit while they curl up at the laptop, much like all of us do at home. So Mr. Pitt and I actually had the opportunity to attend the LCC superintendent breakfast this morning. And one of the stats that was shared, and this is not exact, but you know, 10 years ago, 10% of our students were graduating with some kind of college credit. Today, almost 50% of our kids, and I would argue here it might be more, um, of our kids are graduating with some kind of college credit, meaning they're interfacing with colleges in a different way that you know, perhaps we did. And so it is interesting to see their perspective and what their expectations are as our main consumers of this building in the future. So I, you know, I really appreciate TDA's, um, you know, attention to detail and things that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily think about, but as we have to consider what this building will look like ultimately once we get some of these um, groups of people, you know, in their feedback together, I think it's really interesting to consider you know, how we're going to outfit these spaces. So thank you, Mr. Fred. So Mr. Fred, that her say this, is there studies to support the kids are doing, they're more prone and successful to independent learning where they have more say in how their day looks and how the, the choices that they are presented with versus again, the traditional, we're gonna feed you all this information. I mean, is there studies to support how much more successful they are after they leave? There are. And, and, yeah, and there's two ways to look at that, and both of them support that student-centered learning environment. So the first is just that, making the student the focus, teaching what the student specifically needs versus just teaching all of our kids the same stuff. Um, absolutely, there's a high correlation there. And then the second piece of that is just having that student choice piece and what they're learning. Uh, both of those pieces, if you look at the research, are going to show that, you know, really the direction the district has been moving for a number of years with students choosing pathways that are based on interests and long-term desires and goals, um, you know, those students are far more successful than just teaching eight mm -hmm. programs. So, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, I don't have a question, but what you just said, I mean, that survey really showed that student-centered learning, a testament to what is already being done, despite the environment um, that those kids have, that they, I mean, obviously, when they move on to college, they have much more 
flexibility and choice uh, because you don't have the same standards prescribed to them, but that the students are able to recognize that down to freshmen, it's very impressive to what's happening already in the, in the district. Absolutely. We are in a much better spot than a lot of places who are embarking on, you know, a transition of high schools. Mm -hmm. I think it's the best way to say it. David, what kind of um, interaction are we going to have with our middle school students? Like in terms of, are we doing a survey similar to this with, with that population of students who will, most of them will see or be um, a student at least maybe for a year in our new building? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. Do you have anything planned for that? It's not anything we have dove deeply into yet. We have certainly had that conversation about not only that student piece, but the staff piece as well. So the staff that works in a little more collaborative building and has been here for six or seven years now. You know, what what right, what challenges do they still have so that, you know, the adjustments that we can make will make that building the best that it can be. So we have had that conversation. We don't have anything out the books quite yet. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. One of the other pieces that um, I wanted to share was we did have middle school students represented in our vision eight day. So we yes. went down to seventh grade. We had two students from seventh grade through 12th grade. And I have to tell you, uh, there were a couple board members here who, you know, probably could speak to it better, but just, you know, sort of leading the room and seeing what the students, uh, you know, were doing at their individual tables in terms of taking a leadership role, but also being the first to come up and present mm -hmm. um, and to talk about the things that mattered and really had, I think, a very good view of what, you know, high school maybe looks like, what it should look like. Um, they all talked about that right balance of, you know, a little traditional, but also with the idea of having a student-centered approach. They all had great ideas um, that I think our architects took back and were able to, uh, you know, perhaps depict what they were saying to a very large group of adults for the most part. And I think they represented themselves awesome. And, you know, even our seventh graders and eighth graders who got up, you know, I couldn't have told you what grades they were in because they were so mature and they were um, very well spoken. And I think really did an outstanding job of representing their individual classes and grades. So um, we will continue to engage them. And as Mr. Pritt said, there is, you know, uh, we do want to engage with the staffs in other buildings, not just high school, you know, to learn about things that you know, they are doing that are going well, that perhaps didn't go the way that they had wanted, or, um, you know, we're still growing in some cases. And so just learning a little bit about that would be helpful. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the superintendent's report. All right. Like this. Here's announcements and hearing of the public. If there's anybody in attendance this evening that would like to address the Board of Education, now is your opportunity. Yes, Last, excuse me, last board meeting, I spoke here. And then three, four days later, I went down to Canton and watched the state swimming meet. Um, it's a great meet. And they build themselves as the best high school meet in the country. And I agree. Uh, but it was a, it wasn't a very good day for Northeast Ohio swim and Greater Cleveland swimming in general. Um, Normandy was the highest placing public school in Northeast Ohio in Division One at twenty sixth position. They had one boy. Um, they ended up finishing twenty sixth, but that was the highest placed public school for boys. Avon's girls did pretty well. Um, all the Schools that finished in the top 10, except Ignatius, uh, are from Columbus area or Cincinnati area. They all have pools. Um, and 
they, they have the benefit of having kids that start in their program and they're like that. And then they continue through that program until they're done with high school. Um, here, we don't have that benefit. And we have kids that are turned away because the teams that are around North Ridgeville just don't have enough room for people. Um, there's teams that try to put eight or nine, eight-year-olds in a lane together. And that is not a good time for anybody. Um, there's teams that have experimented with 12 eight-year-olds in a lane. That's just a horrible time for everybody because eight-year-olds are eight-year-olds. Yeah. Um, so a lot of our swimmers, when they reach high school, they are five, six, seven years or more behind what their peers in other parts of the state are because those teams have the ability to have kids grow up swimming. We don't. Um, North Regional, I was very lucky to be in contact with a couple people who have histories of state records, um, one of which is the coach from Mason High School. And from 1973 to 1982, every single year, the boys swim team placed in the top 25. There were two state champions in that time. Uh, one was Kevin Mills, who won the 100 breaststroke in 1974. And he did set a state record that year. And then he broke his state record the following year. Um, he finished second, though. Um, and then in 1982, Dave Vallega won the 100 plus. I did not know about Dave Vallega until I was given these records. It turns out that he had a very successful swimming career. He was five times first team to all Ohio swimming. Uh, I did not know that. He's apparently getting a banner now, too. So. Um, I'm also fairly sure there's other people that qualified and placed in the top, like after seventh or seventh or later or ninth or later. But the records that were I were given for complete, so I'm still looking at those. Um, if we had our own pool, we could have similar to what other areas of the state has. We could have kids that grow up swimming, and we could have kids that, by the time they reach high school, have been competing for five, six, seven, whatever years, and they're competitive, not just locally but throughout the entire state. Um, North Ridgeville used to be really, really good at swimming. The uh, entrance over on Pitts Road has a plaque or entrance marker, I don't know what you want to call it, donated by the swimming boosters in 1992. Um, the swim team was really, really good, but because of the lack of pool, it fell apart in 1996. And then 22 years later, 23 years later, it started again. We are, this year we sent 60% of our boys team, 50% of our girls team to districts. Um, last year it was 70% of the boys team. We have the potential to be what that team was back in the 70s and the 80s. However, the facilities that we have aren't the best for that. Because we are asking kids right now to spend four hours an evening to go to practice. Because it's a long way to Cuyahoga Heights, two hours of practice, and then a long way back. Uh, North Ridgeville is a growing community. It's, I think, the fastest growing in Orion County for sure. And then, like, the whole west side of Cleveland, I think, is the fastest growing there. Um, we have the potential to do that again, like what it, the team was in the 70s. But the facilities just need to increase. 
Well, we absolutely appreciate the information. And we're looking at many things when it comes to the design of this new building. And we appreciate the stats and facts. Um, and we heard you, and we heard your last meeting as well. Clearly, you have a desire for a poll. We understand that. Um, and like I said, we're looking at every avenue as far as what's going to be included in the city. Well, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else this evening that would like to address the board? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. My name is Frank Toth. I reside at 35300 Nikki Avenue. And this evening, I wanted to, um, to address the board and the administration and the staff after uh, Ms. Roth forwarded me a copy of the agenda this afternoon. And I noticed right here, black and white, item seven on the finance report, Resolution providing for the issuance and sale of bonds. Four and a half years ago, I initially approached the Board of Education about some questions I had regarding the 2019 version of Issue 16. And through the last four and a half years, it's been a long, strange trip for everyone involved. <laughs> The various itinerations of this um, past of the electric. And I think throughout it all, what I came to admire was the dedication of you folks working behind the scenes to make this happen. And when I saw this in black and white tonight or today, it was absolutely imperative to me to be able to come up here and to congratulate all of you for sticking with this and embarking on this project this project, which, you know, is probably the biggest thing to happen in North Ridgeville ever. So I want to congratulate you all. Thank you for your dedication and your determination. And it really is an exciting time to be a North Ridgeville Ranger. So appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Mr. Tauf, it's because of people like you and everybody else that came out in support of us, our parents, our different support groups, you absolutely have been a part of this through the whole process, and you're as much responsible for that being on tonight's agenda as anybody else in this room. So thank you to you and everybody else that volunteered their time and their efforts, their finances. It was an absolutely collaborative team effort, and thank you. Thank you, sir. I didn't forget the, uh, the form tonight. <laughs> Is there any announcements this evening? Seeing none, we'll move into the consent agenda. Uh, we have an education report, Ms. Saxon. Yes, we have five agreements and one overnight field trip under the education report. The agreements we have for your consideration are four multi-year math adoption contracts. These include SAVAS, I say that correctly, <laughs> Envision for grades K through five, EDGEMS math for grades six through seven and eighth grade algebra one at RHTA. McGraw Hill reveal for grade eight in high school and send gauge learning for AP calculus BC. Our final agreement is a contract with frontline professional learning management to add a new professional development and growth database and system for the district. Finally, we have an overnight field trip for your consideration. The field trip is an out of the country service trip to Peru, which would happen during the summer of 2025. This is the first reading for these items. The second reading and consideration for approval will be at the March 19th regular meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, communications report, Mr. Grigsby. Thank you, Mr. Baca. It is recommended that the Board of Education accept the following gifts of appreciation. $3,340 was donated by the Lions Club of North Ridgeville Educational Outreach Program 
for the teachers and staff members of the North Bridgeville City School District. A gently used clarinet was donated by the Morningstar family to the North Bridgeville High School Band Program. $2,515 was donated by the Athletic Boosters to purchase three tees, two bonnets, a rebound screen, and an L screen to the North Ridgeville High School softball team. 2,000 solar eclipse glasses were donated by North Ridgeville Lee Orthodontics to NRAC for students to use on Solar Eclipse Day. $568 was donated by North Ridgeville Police Association to the NRAC to go towards students to attend the Washington, D.C. trip. A donation of $2,555 was donated by the North Ridgeville Athletic Boosters to purchase a baseball hack attack machine for a North Ridgeville High School baseball team. And as always, we thank our community for the tremendous support for our schools and students. Thank you. Buildings and operations, we have one resolution for your consideration. An overall bid amount of $126,450 was submitted by C.T. Taylor for the renovation of a gymnasium space at Liberty Elementary School. This is the first reading for this item. The second reading and consideration for approval will be at the March 19th regular meeting. Okay, human resources report, Mr. Haynes. We have five items in the human resources report. One support staff substitute contract, one hour, hourly tutor contract, one certified staff adjustment, two certified staff leave of absences, one support staff leave of absence, one supplemental resignation, this is the first reading of these items. The second reading with consideration of approval will be on the March 19th regular meeting. This concludes the human resources report. Okay. Perfect. Everybody ready? <laughs> They're the exciting part of this evening. And Ms. McCarthy's going to read every word of this resolution. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go up, friend. We only got 15 pages. But if I could summarize it for you, I would like to say I'll summarize. We have one item for consideration under the finance report. It's a resolution authorizing the issuance of bonds and sets forth the parameters within which they are to be issued. The proceeds of the bonds will be used to retire when due the district's outstanding $15 million school improvement notes at the maturity on September 19th, 2024, and provide up to an additional $128,015,000 of new money for the high school construction projects. Ladies and gentlemen, I move to approve this bond resolution in one reading. Second. Moved by Ms. McCarthy, seconded by Ms. Faxon. Is there any discussion this evening? Roll call, please. Mrs. McCarthy? Yes. Mrs. Saxon? Yes. Mr. Grigsby? Yes. Mr. Haynes? Yes. Mr. Baca? Yes. Building and operations report. The technology department is requesting approval for a quote from Southeast Security not to exceed $468,000, covering the procurement of access points, switches, and installation schedule for this upcoming summer. Furthermore, the department requests approval of a separate quote not to exceed $14,000 to cover maintenance and support for, district, for the district starting July 1, 2024. A portion of this expense will be reimbursed through the federal E-rate funds. After careful evaluation, the technology department has deemed Southeast Securities quote as the most suitable and competitively priced solution aligned with the district's requirements. I move to approve technology items in one item. One reading right there. Second. And by uh, motion by myself, second by Ms. McCarthy. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Baca? Yes. Mrs. McCarthy? Yes. Mr. Grigsby? Yes. Mr. Haynes? Yes. Mrs. Saxon? Yes. Thank you. Uh, human Resources Report, Mr. Haynes? Yes. We have two items to consider under the Human Resources Report. One support staff appointment, one non-NREA supplemental contract that moved to approve the Human Resource items in one reading. Second. Moved by Mr. Haynes, second by Ms. Saxon. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Haynes? Yes. Mrs. Saxon? Yes. Mr. Grigsby? Yes. Mr. McCarthy? Yes. Mr. Baca? Yes. Right. It is recommended that the Board of Education enter into executive session to discuss the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, compensation of public employees and matters related to negotiation with public employees. There will be no action to follow. Moved. 
Second. Okay, by Mr. McCarthy, second by Mr. Grigsby. Roll call, please. Mrs. McCarthy? Yes. Mr. Grigsby? Yes. Mr. Haynes? Yes. Mrs. Saxon? Yes. Mr. Baca? Yes. 6.30 back. 